How did so here? How you doing? Hoping to lay down a track, maybe 10, 12 minutes, uh, maybe four or five photographs and a bit of chatter. And uh, so continuing on from the previous video, looking at the world and the Pacific and the biggest pond around these parts, I thought I'd take a bit of a closer look at that. So I'm gonna get out of the way and let you look at the picture behind me and I'll chatter in the background. And if you want, you can turn on the text feature in YouTube and read along, I guess. Hopefully that works okay. Anyway, this is a picture of the Pacific Plate from the Wikipedia page of the Pacific Plate. And um, there we go. Uh, and it's the North Pacific. Uh, you can see the coast of North America, including Baja and Vancouver Island and the Strait of Georgia and the Aleutians and Kamchatka and off to the west side. I don't think that's the Philippines. Um, it might be Japan. No, it's a bit south of Japan. Anyway, um, but why I bring this to your attention is somebody asked what some of my favorite geological formations. And um, she wants to introduce me to a geologist. And so I thought I'd touch on a couple of geology points. Kind of um, central to this image is uh, the Hawaiian emperor chain. And the Hawaiian islands have a hot spot underneath them. And that hot spot has been moving across the Pacific plate for many, many, many years. And the bend in it is actually one of my favorite bits of evidence of deep time. And <clears throat> so I'm gonna switch to this image for another, to continue on with this topic. And there we go. This is another closer look at the Hawaiian emperor chain and the bend in it. And this one's marked out with uh, dates for when this chain of volcanoes, the Hawaiian islands are the ones that poke up over the Pacific surface, but a whole bunch of older ones stretch back in time. And this one shows how far back in time they stretch, with Hawaii being zero million years ago, and Midway, 28 million, the pivot point, 47 million, uh, the, the top up by Kamchatka and the Aleutians, that's 80 million years ago. And the pivot point, 47 million years, means that the Hawaiian chain is 47 million years, and that the emperor chain is 33 million years, and 47 and 33 is 80. Uh, the, the pivot point is pivotal. Um, and it's evidence of something. And it's something that I poke around and conjecture about and look into. And how I explain it is that the hot spot, some geologists are wondering why the hot spot changed direction. And to me, 
That's looking at the situation from the wrong angle. The hotspot didn't change its direction. The Pacific plate changed its direction. Um, the hotspot's a fountain of heat underneath the ocean's underplate, the Pacific plate. And um, what changed the direction of the Pacific plate? Well, about 47 million years ago, India had a collision with Asia. And that, that collision has since then been building the Himalayas, the root of the world. And that collision was so violent and so impactful and big that it more than rippled out around the world. It actually, India hit Asia so hard that Asia hit the Pacific and caused it to pivot. And all of this, all of these plates are kind of floating on an under, undersea of lava. And this is kind of an illustration of both a compound collision with multiple bank shots off a billiard table kind of thing. But also that everything is interdependent and dancing together. And it's kind of incredible. And <clears throat> this time, time map has many uses. Um, like uh, the, the meteorite that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs about 60, 67 million years ago is just about Hyuko, uh, 61 million years. So 67 million years, that's when the, the meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula and caused the dinosaur extinction. Um, but I'm actually coming at this more from a paleoclimatology angle, as in long-term climate. And one of the significant events is in that field is the pet M Paleoemian thermal maximum, PETM. And that was 55.5 million years ago. So that's just around them, just a bit above the middle of the uh, emperor chain, 55 and a bit million years ago. And that was a significant temperature surge for the planet. Okay, so that's one angle of approach on that. Another is actually after the pivot, after the bend, actually the name of this map, I found it in a scientific study and it's spelled H-E-B, Hawaiian Emperor Bend. And you can look it up if, like, if you like. Um, the thing is, is that at the bend is the birth of the Himalaya. And as the Hawaiian chain unfolds through its tens of millions of years, the roof of the world is growing. The Himalayan plateau is stretching up and up through the atmosphere into the upper levels of the atmosphere. And that actually starts peeling out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And 
as you come across the Hawaiian chain in paleoclimatological time, um, not only is the roof of the world growing, but the climate is cooling because the roof of the world is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And so the emperor chain time is much warmer than now. And as you cross the Hawaiian chain, things are cooling. And as the CO2 is coming down, the glaciers are starting to grow in Antarctica. And the ice ages are starting. And it's kind of incredible. And <clears throat> just as in another use of this, this tool for reading time, if you look down to Hawaii in <clears throat> much more recent time, you'd actually have a hard time sketching out uh, people in our presence here. Um, about 200,000 years ago, the Neanderthals left Africa and went on to Asia and Europe. And, and you can barely scrape a fingernail of that in this time scale, and you go back to the Homo sapiens left Africa, crossing the Red Sea into Asia, India, that was um, 60,000 years ago. And they got to um, Australia 40,000 years ago, and they crossed the, the Bering Strait up above about 10 to 12,000 years ago. And so you can barely see human time on this time scale, but this time scale is a reflection of reality. Okay, um, let's see. I got a third picture. Uh, I'll put that out. There it is. Now, what the what is the Pacific plate floating on? And um, that's the asthenosphere. Um, you can see here an ocean plate and a continental plate and a subduction zone. And you'll notice that the continental plate is maybe twice as thick as the oceanic plate. The oceanic plate is thinner and more bendable. And so it goes under in the subduction zone. And the asthenosphere I, I'm into words and I, I look at etymologies and, and I play around with words. They're symbols, um, language. We communicate with them. Anyways, as, then, o, sphere. As, then, o, sphere. As, then, as in a time, as a space in time kind of thing. And um, for me, <clears throat> it also rhymes with Athens, as in Athens sphere. Um, and why I no make a note of that harmony, that rhyme, um, that way of remembering is because while I am um, fascinated by long-term climate, 
that's only one of my special interests. And another major one is what is a citizen? What is science? And freedom of speech. And those things kind of were born in Athens. And so I, I have a lot of um, kind of heroes of thinking that are kind of based back then. And so I'll be coming back to mentioning Athens and Greece and words. Oh, words. Athenosphere, Athens in this context, etymologically comes from Greek and it means weak or yielding. And it's kind of <clears throat> a little bit insulting, but also a little bit wild. And um, just to play around with the ideas, but from a different perspective, um, the masculine and the feminine, the sword and the sheath um, are also known in the Tao from the other side of the Pacific for the firm and the yielding, the male and the female, the, uh, the strong and the gracious. Uh, there's a whole lot of corollaries around these ideas. But the point of it that I want to point mention is that the weakness and the yielding, that the butch and the tough disparage is actually a different kind of strength. It's a strength like water, a yielding, but a buoyancy. Uh, and when I was a kid, I go up to a pond on a little mountain. And sometimes I'd fish for minnows with one of my mom's old stockings. Other times I'd look at other things. I was particularly fascinated by water strider, these insects that could walk on water. And it's something I studied and appreciated. They, they can turn surface tension into a tool and a road. And not many can do that. And surface tension is a product of different kinds of things that have differing density being in proximity and having a relationship with one another. And the surface tension between air and water, water is 400 times denser than air. Air moves very freely, water moves much less freely, but still a whole lot more freely than stone. And so water's weakness to stone or wood, which has buoyancy and gives you a demonstration of displacement and surface tension. And buoyancy is a force. And it's a force that the continental shelf and the ocean crest both exercise buoyancy. Okay, so um, I'm trying to fit this into 10 or 12 minutes. So I'll mention, um, whoops, another picture. Oh, sorry, I didn't add it to the index here yet. Um,
There it is. A silly little thing, but we'll give it a go. Um, I mentioned being a kid and checking out water striders. Um, just uh, coming at this all from a different angle. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I actually have a memory as to when my memory started and I was four years old and I was watching TV. It was late afternoon and Howdy Doody was on. And uh, uh, the parents were in the kitchen and they were knocking off another bottle of whiskey and the fight was starting again. And I was four. And I felt like crying again, but looked over my options and um, decided that I was tired of crying and um, the, the parents rising fight, you know, how a four-year-old responds to the fight in the background. Yeah, that's kind of one of my first memories. <clears throat> maybe even the one that I kind of woke up on. And so this character pops to mind every once in a while, Howdy. And, well, a bit more about alcoholism. Turned out I got it too. But I got sober. And so I had to learn a whole bunch about recovery. And that's something I've got to talk about too. And um, <clears throat> Howdy is a kind of acronym that um, kind of bounces for me. And it goes like this, honesty, open-mindedness, willingness. Like, howdy, and D-Y, do you, do you, kind of thing. Might be <clears throat> just a silly little acronym to play with, but a kid has to find their way in the world, don't they? And it's a pretty big world. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> Before I wrap, I'm going to switch back to the first one because I think it's kind of gorgeous and um, you can look to see how deep it is. The, the Pacific average is <clears throat> about five kilometers deep. <clears throat> the deepest parts are over eight kilometers deep, almost nine, I think. And um, so that's a whole lot of water. But there's a whole nother ocean underneath that crash that oceanic plate. The oceanic plate is about 50 kilometers deep, maybe 60. The continental is bigger both on top and underneath, and it's over 100 kilometers deep, maybe 120. So there are variable depths between the plates. But underneath the plates, the other ocean that they're floating on, the asthenosphere, that's, <clears throat> that's variable viscosity. Variable viscosity, kind of like a double V like Vancouver and Victoria. Um, and so parts of it 
are soft rock, yielding, clayish, clayish, pushable, bendable, and parts of it are thicker, or thinner than soft rock, but thicker than liquid, like chunky soup, like folders and pea soup and real thick stuff. And then thinner stuff and thinner stuff down to gravy, down to water, and even in some of the hotter fluid parts, a kind of oily thinness like, like lubricant. And all of that is in the asthenosphere. And thing is, it's a whole bunch deeper than both the water layer and the <clears throat> crest layer. It varies between 120 kilometers to 400 kilometers and maybe even more in area. And as a volume compared to the hydrosphere, the water sphere, the asthenosphere is much more immense by orders of magnitude of the water sphere. Um, and I got to do some calculations, <clears throat> scouting around for details on what what's the comparative differential in volume between the hydrosphere and the asthenosphere. But they're both very liquid and but very different kinds of liquid. And there's multiple levels of surface tension in between all the different pressure and density differential that are being stepped through, through the layer. So there's multiple flavors of surface tension. Anyway, uh, there's a bit of chatter from me and I'm gonna lay it down a track and see if I can move it along into shareability. So thank you very kindly for now and we'll see if I can get this up. Howdy and be well. Ciao.